So today we are going to have a conversation with Bendy, and we're supposed to talk about philosophy. This is the first conversation, by the way, which I have on a Discord. I never recorded conversations on Discord before, and I hope it's going to be good. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see how it's going. Uh, Bendy, hello. Hello. How are you? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm fine. Yes, I am. So, uh, I I would like to ask you from the beginning uh, about philosophy. How did you start to study in it, and uh, you know, what what what's what are your interests in philosophy? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm the first sort of philosopher I've ever heard about, or I've ever like got into was Alan Watts. I was in, I was like 17 in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I just kind of stumbled upon his work on some of his lectures. And then like, it wasn't even like I was sort of looking for philosophy. It just kind of happened. And then I enjoyed listening to him. Then he talked about a lot of concepts. Like he talked about philosophical materialism, he talked about uh, Eastern religion, which can be like some people just compare them to philosophy or Eastern philosophy. Yeah. And I started reading like buddhist texts after from him he's got me into that looked up like philosophical materialism and such and then like it just went from there i mean mm-hmm. then yeah uh alan woods uh i remember yeah i had i had probably similar experience but a little bit later i, I was 21 and i read osho and osho also uh, have you heard of this, this guy osho like uh no, no, I've never heard of him. What's what, uh, he's, he, he's an Indian mystic, and his idea is also quite close to what Alan Watts is talking about. Also, when he was young, he studied he studied uh, Marxism, but later he developed like his own cult, uh, became very controversial oh, wow. figure. And uh, yeah, can we can we talk a little bit more about Alan Watts? Like, how how do you perceive uh, his uh, like his philosophical views? Um, I don't know how to describe him. I know that he was. Um, I know that I forget the the term. He was a. Uh, I forget the the term, but like I know some other stuff about him. Like he was, he described himself as believing in a Hindu god. So I mean, he could I could effectively call him a Hindu. Yeah, I don't. Are you asking like about his positions or my thoughts? By the way, I don't know if I'm going off track. But mm-hmm. uh, I remember like uh, mostly this kind of superficial uh, impression. But anyway, so when I was listening to his uh, lectures, uh, he talked a lot about uh, the mind and that you have to like let 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 go, <laughs> let go of your you know your mind. So essentially, the idea is that your mind makes you sick, and when you think a lot, it's actually unnatural, and uh, it the cause of all problems. Not all problems. I'm obviously oversimplifying it, but like this idea that uh, when you think too much, that there's uh, like you only try to make sense, you are missing something, something real, maybe like experience or senses or. Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds, that's, I would agree. I mean, that, yeah, that's my interpretation of the stuff he says as well. Yeah, I remember yeah. some, some exp- like a chatter in the skull. <laughs> like his, yeah. <laughs> expressions uh, related to language. Uh, do, do you think, do, do, do you think that this is, like this view when you try to uh, voluntarily not use your do, do not use your mind when you try to like stop thinking do you think it's actually possible to reach this state when you don't do not need to like use language like some kind of trans transcendental state uh, which they describe in buddhism when they say that uh, the mind just you know kind of stops yeah i would say the, uh, yeah, I would. You can definitely get to that state. Like, I mean, it's I. I would not trying to like, to, like it's not anything to brag about. But yeah, like if I've done it, like I've, and I would say I'm at the state right now. Like, in terms of not having chatter in the school and not needing to think in terms of like sounds or like language, mm-hmm. like chatter in the school, having none of that. Yeah, I mean that's that's very possible. 
Can you describe how, how are you doing this, like meditation or like what kind of actions you have to undertake to reach this state? Um, meditation was how I, I got here, I would say, but I don't like try. It's not like something I actively try to do anymore. Um, so, I mean, I don't, really wasn't actively trying to do it in the first place, but I, I don't even meditate anymore. So it just kind of lasted from the meditation. But yeah, meditation, like just sitting and doing nothing. And eventually your mind will, you'll stop having chatter. Like it's not even something you have to intentionally try to do. Do you meditate for a while? And I've, I've heard other people, I've talked to other people who uh, practice Buddhism. And they tell me that the same thing that they have like no chat, no uh, internal monologue, and such. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I had similar experience uh, probably five years ago, and I came to the exactly opposite conclusion. So I was sitting, you know, try to meditate, and finally I realized that this this whole thing is not about uh, stopping your mind; it's about <laughs> starting to think. <laughs> so you see, you see that until you like, you know, uh, kind of reverse psychology. So, for example, when you try to stop your mind, you see that there are lots of thoughts immediately uh, appear. And uh, when like somebody tells you, like, what what are you thinking about? And you try to come up with something, there's nothing. But if somebody tells you, like, don't think, <laughs> don't think, you it's kind of controversial and you start thinking and there's so many ideas. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Like, my kind of way was that I decided that I have to work on my thoughts. So instead of stopping them, I have to make, make sense out of what's going on, try to describe uh, clearly what I perceive, what I think about. I wouldn't call it the chat room the skull, but uh, for me, it's uh, it's mostly uh, like I'm trying to be aware of my thoughts and I do not try to suppress them. Because before, yeah, I, I guess I, I, I'm guilty of doing that too much when I just try to, you know, do not think, follow your breath, follow your, you know, like feelings. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that it's, it's definitely going to be hard to if you're actively like, and if you're intentionally pursuing it and yeah like i think that there's you shouldn't try to stop thinking like yeah i agree you should try to practice reasoning and thinking more so and it comes to like just general like thoughts like chatter in the school like an internal monologue just all throughout the day i mean if you don't want that i don't i don't think that the way to to uh, get rid of it is to try like meditating it will just happen eventually like it's not something you have to try to do or anything but really i'm not i'm not even saying that you shouldn't have internal monologue i mean it's fine like i mean mm -hmm. it's just something that doesn't happen often for me because ever since doing the meditation but i don't think that it's a bad thing at all or yeah that you should that anyone should try to but yeah can i ask you a question relating to this mm -hmm. oh yeah also can i ask you a question relating to this yeah sure Oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, when you were uh, listening to these people like Watson and, and and such, uh, were you were you ever like actively um, like practicing like actually? Well, you said pra uh, stuff like follow your breath and stuff. So I'm assuming you actually were like meditating and stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. I, pra I, I, pra I practiced okay. it for quite a long time, probably for eight years, oh. and I'm still doing that. Oh. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't say that I follow any, you know, I've read lots of books on that and uh, on Buddhism and on other religious and philosophy. And I wouldn't uh, say that I follow any particular, you know, person. For me, it's kind of, I'm, try, I'm, try, I'm trying to combine various techniques. And uh, remember this guy Osho, whom I mentioned at the beginning. So I, uh, I would say that firstly, I started uh, like doing this meditation and stuff uh, 2007 after reading one of his books and it was about dynamic meditation so he suggested uh, that you shouldn't just sit but you like there are some four stages in this meditation and uh, you perform certain actions and finally it leads to some sort of catharsis and I like my journey started <laughs> from like from this type of meditation but then I like try try ver various others and I'm still, I, I still don't like, I'm, and I'm, I'm not as, I'm probably, as you said, like I'm already in this state too, but I do not do anything on purpose to, to get there. And I would describe it as, you know, I'm, 
kind of determinist. So mm -hmm. I think that everything what's going on is going on only in one way. And I'm trying to stay kind of in this state of uh, in the, in, in, the pre in the present moment. And I do not worry about the future too much because future for me is basically uh, all its continuation of the past. So I do not think about past in terms of uh, how could I change something in the past. I know like for me, I'm, uh -huh. I, I'm convinced that whatever happened in the past, there was, there was no way that it uh, could happen otherwise. And I also think the same way about the future. So I think that the future is basically the continuation of what was going on before. So for me, it's like I'm watching a movie. Uh, I'm not living life. I'm just watching a movie where uh, the part of me which acts, uh, I know that this is kind of, this is a movie. And the part of me that observes this movie yeah, I mostly identify with this part, with not with not an actor, but with an observer. Is that? Yeah, it seems it seems very much like you listen to people like Watts from listening to you, or from yeah. But I agree with most of what you said. Yeah, I'm a big fan of those kind of people. That's why. Yeah. But, yeah, but with, with Watts, uh, I recently listened. Uh, you know, I now I run an English speaking club, and every week I study a new concept, like a new idea. This uh -huh. week, for, this week, week for example, I'm studying the concept of truth. But uh, a couple of months ago, I studied the concept of Tao. So I read Tao the Jin, and uh, I stumbled on Alan Watts again, and I listened to uh, one of his lectures. Like it's a, it, it was quite a long lecture for probably last for three hours. And I was, uh, yeah, I was impressed by his ability to, you know, articulate all these uh, mostly Eastern concepts, like ideas. But sometimes I feel that, uh, you know, most of the time it resonates with me, but sometimes I feel that, you know, this uh, over, you know, he tries to attack like this rationality of language. He tries to say that all, all this, you know, kind of useless. And, uh, and this part, I guess I can't agree with him because for me, like it's uh, like both experience and language, uh, I would say they are both important. So if you try to uh, prioritize one over the other, it, all, it all often leads to some problems. Yeah, I sort of agree with you. I mean, yeah, I, I try to include everything like rationality experience although i am a radical empiricist i mean yeah. well, let's, I, I pretty much yeah, agree let's, with you though let's talk a little, a little bit more about this like radical empiricism can you outline yeah. like briefly what's what's the position is and how how, how you yeah. came up with it okay well for me particularly i'm like extremely on the radical end so but yeah i came up with it i mean like i came up with it with it from assimilating a bunch of stuff like before I even knew what epistemology was and then when I came to like reading about epistemology I realized like I'm on the radical end of empiricism like I just kind of uh, realized it but yeah I just prioritize direct experience uh more than anything so like when it comes to sort of uh epistemology that bases knowledge on sense data and experience first I mean I'm just like going to be far on the end but like uh to to get to give some explanation of what uh, radical empiricism or my uh, specific type is i believe that knowledge comes from the phenomenal field like it's what i call it it's a more of a metaphysical concept or metaphysics sort of uh, concept so i wouldn't describe um i wouldn't describe knowledge as coming from sense data Mm -hmm. uh, like for example, so let me um, let me get a little bit better and explain it so yeah, far. Sure. So, yeah, the the traditional empiricist position is that knowledge comes from the senses. Then you have more radical empiricists like uh, Ernst Mach, and I don't know who's another one off the top of my head, but he's like a phenomenalist, and he would say that he would say it's something more similar to me, but he would co wouldn't call it the phenomenal field. He would just uh, I don't know what he would call it, but regardless. Yeah, he would say that all objects exist only as potential sense datum or potential uh, appearances. He called them sensations, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that word's fine. But yeah, for me, I would describe, 
<clears throat> scrap the whole sensations thing and just say that reality ultimately is in appearances and that we just have direct access to the appearances and not it's not filtered through well I would, it's not that it's not filtered through but since data comes secondary basically like for example if you're in a dream and it appears that you're sensing like you're seeing something from your eyes like a cow or some or like a tree or something I would say that that's a, a a real cow. Like the boundary between a cow mm-hmm. and the and a dream and a cow right here is just the different experiences or different parts of the phenomenal field. And yeah, so basically, senses are a part of the experience or, or a part of the phenomenal field, and the experiences behind the phenomena. I mean, behind the senses, the senses are something that's secondary. So rather than just traditional empiricism where it prioritizes sort of, um, you know, sense datum and the whole, and that and those whole sort of concepts. It's just a more, let's just r- more radical in the sense of its description. Like I wouldn't, it's not really, like I don't know if this is given the distinction there. I mean, but yeah. So uh, your experience includes sense da- data, right? So it's like experience, yeah. it's more broad. So yeah, it's... exactly, exactly. That was, that was perfect. Uh, you said about the cow in a dream, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I I would like to ask you, like, have you tried uh, lucid dreams? Like, you know, are you are you familiar with this concept and uh, lu- lu- lucid dreams? Yeah, yes, I'm yes, I'm familiar with lucid dreams. Uh, I've you, done it before once. Have, yeah. have you tried like lucid dreams? Uh, it just kind of happened one day. <laughs> well, I, uh, oh, one day, without, without an intention. Yeah, without intention. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it just one day, or you try to practice? Like, as for me, I tried to practice it for for many years. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, no, I've never tried it before, but it, it happened one day. So it was just happened, and then you like didn't experience it later, or mm, no? I've, this never happened since. It just happened like one night. Okay, uh, can, you, was... can, can, can you can can tell me more about like what was going on? yeah so it was just this girl i knew back in middle school it was like uh we were both way older and it's like i met her again and we were just like doing stuff like we were like walking through a park and stuff and then like somehow we ended up in a building going on an elevator there was just a lot of stuff going on i mean it was just like i spent the whole day with her though but i don't know why like i dreamed that but uh how how, how long uh, could you keep uh, this awareness of a dream in in a dream um i'm not sure what do you i don't know i'm kind of but w- was it kind of uh, you know some lasting experience for example that you may feel like it's for about like 5 10 15 minutes or it's just a uh, kind of spark of awareness and then it disappears um it lasted for a long time like i was lucid for a while it felt just like right here it felt just like right now like i mean if yeah i was lucid for like i don't know how long but it was at least well it was way longer than 15 minutes like it felt way longer than 15 minutes it felt like hours wow but, that's, yeah. that's cool and uh, i actually like i i started practicing it after like i read castaneda uh, and uh, like, do, do you know Castaneda, Carlos Castaneda? No, I don't know who that is. Uh, he, he talks about it a lot. Uh, basically, he was the guy who introduced me to this concept. He was a writer. Um, like uh, he, he wrote his major works starting from 1969, I guess, the teaching of Don Juan, and then he later wrote eight more books, like this, describing all these ideas and. Uh, I remember that at first it was very hard to get to this state. You know, there's some techniques like uh, you may start consciously looking at your hands every yeah. in in your in your in your wakeful time, like every 15 minutes or every hour. You do certain like it's like an exercise. So you look at your hand hands and you ask the question: Am I aware? Am I in a like in in reality? And uh, well, you. Look around, yeah, this is real, okay. Uh, next half an hour, you do the same. And at, at some moment, you kind of, you develop a habit and then the same happens in a dream. 
so it's very unusual but you then you look at your hands and wow this is <laughs> like am i in in reality and then you know it's not reality it's a dream so it took me four months like to develop this uh, you know develop this habit and finally to develop this awareness in the dream and i would say it was such a such an incredible experience so i started practicing it for i would say for six years yeah i tried to like de de develop this and finally it all led to some you know the stage when i <laughs> in a dream uh as you described i was very long time there i don't know maybe it was half an hour maybe it was uh maybe it was more but it felt as if i was there for a very long time and uh, I couldn't, you know, I had these ideas that there's no way to get out of there. So I, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a movie, it's called The, the uh, Awake, The Wakefulness of Life. Um, damn it, I forgot the, let me check it, translation. Like, uh, I, I, I watched it in Russian language and I don't know the translation. Probably you watched this movie too. And there's a guy who can't get out of a dream. Oh. Uh. It's two thousand uh, year movie. Like it was. Uh, that sounds really interesting, actually. Two thousand, two thousand one. Uh, 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 Waking life, yeah. English name is Waking mm -hmm. Life, and it's not. Yeah, you, you, you can, if you, if you haven't watched it, I guess it will be interesting to check it out. Yeah. Yeah, but I was almost like in in the same state and. Uh, after that, I decided to stop it, uh, like to, to stop practicing this. Uh, it occurred from time to time later, and now it sometimes occurs like once a month or once in a couple of months. But I know I, I no longer do it on purpose. Like before, I would try to read a dream journal, analyze all these dreams. And yeah, I would, uh, I would completely agree that it feels surreal. I mean, uh, in a dream, yeah emotions which you have uh, mental states it's all the same it all depends i guess on the way how you interpret it yeah i agree like what, what we if we consider this world when there's everything consistent and uh, we can you know we, we have solid objects and uh, things make sense not only on a, like individual level but there's kind of collective sense we're doing we're doing something together but when you when you're in a dream, yeah, it feels as if like all these emotions, uh, whatever you're doing, it's also it also makes perfect sense. So if you if you start yeah. if you start developing like uh, I I even try to kind of to run away from like to, to to run away from reality into a dream world and uh, leave I, I lived there for you know I would say for quite a lot like all this time when I was practicing lucid dreams. Uh, I didn't communicate with people a lot. I was just reading books uh, and, uh, you know, write, writing my journal, thinking and <laughs> practicing this, you know, this stuff. And it was such a creative, wonderful experience. Like, I can't find anything to compare in the real world, which would look similar. But anyway, let's... Uh, you yeah, um, uh, what do you say? Yeah, uh, you, you mentioned this guy... Um, can you repeat his name like uh, who Ernst Mott. Arst, uh, can you spell it Ernst Mott. Arst, oh, Arst. Uh, yeah how do you spell it uh can you type it on the on the, on the chat okay yeah i got it okay Ernst Mott. okay oh it's a it's a german it's german right german I'm sure. Yeah, I think he's German. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I've heard of uh, this guy. Yeah, uh, our, you know, our. There, there's a famous guy uh, from. I forget uh, who was that. I can't remember. But yeah, I, I've heard the critique uh, of this guy by another guy, but I can't remember. I can't remember. Can't remember his name. But uh, I guess this guy, he also was a kind of solipsist, like Ernest Mack. Um, I don't think he was a solipsist. I don't know a whole lot about that, though. I've never heard about anything about people mentioning that he's a solipsist. But yeah, I haven't read his book yet, but he doesn't seem to be to me. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, but what do you think about solipsism? Um, 
So I'm, I have a sort of different position on solipsism than most people. Um, so it depends on what we mean, though. So for one, I think the concept of a mind is sort of different from across people. Like for Descartes, when he says his mind, he doesn't mean his experience. And that's who a lot of people point to for solipsism. But Descartes means his mind is sort of like at the real sort of, um, I don't know, thing that does thinking specifically. Like thinking is what the mind does, not necessarily experience. So like he would deny, he said that you could deny all of your direct experience, but except for the mind, though, like except for or except for like thoughts and such, that's what he meant. But if you change what the mind means to be experience, I mean, it effectively becomes exper- empiricism, I would say, or at least my form of empiricism, which is just pure experience. So it's pretty much identical in that sense. But for traditional, like the uh, Cartesian sort of people, or who people who base uh, the concept of the mind in a Descartes sort of fashion, I don't think it really makes any sense of uh, solipsism. I think that it's a sort of silly position. Mm-hmm. And not like for silly because it's like, you know, like uh, we can know more than that. But just I'm saying it's silly because true skepticism applied to the max doesn't leave anything unquestioned, including the concept that I'm questioning. I don't think that that's something that you can reasonably discard. For example, with the, uh, a sort of dream uh, idea about it. Um or not even a dream, here's a better one. We can leave dreams out of it. In reality, the sound, uh, I am thinking, or something like, I am questioning. Mm-hmm. I could record that and and uh, play it on a phone in the background of somebody's room or whatever. And like, I could, I could play it at a regular sort of pace or whatever. And, or I could just like play it once. And they might hear those sounds, I am thinking, or whatever sort of, sounds they are there's nothing about sounds that translates to specifically thinking like where we can know that i am thinking or something of the sort or i am doubting just because the the sounds i am doubting occur does not mean there's actually someone doubting basically so i think it's sort of a silly just kind of cop out of skepticism but yeah that's my thoughts on it yeah uh what you described is very similar to what, what what i've heard from nietzsche uh, beyond good and evil when he criticized this idea that you know, it's not just you know i'm thinking you 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 can't actually when you say that i am thinking it's not clear what you mean by i what you mean by m <laughs> what you what you mean by thinking so descartes takes it, it all it, it all for granted he says yeah it seems that i understand i know what is thinking i know what is i but all these concepts, they are very problematic if you look at them from this, uh, as you say, skeptical, like skeptical position. So you can you can say anything basically if you're a radical skepticist. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I have a little bit more to add on that. I have a lot of problems with solipsism because the, you, you said with, I'm not familiar, very familiar with Nietzsche, by the way. But on the thinking part, I agree with him about that. But also the concept of I and the concept of a self. As well as problematic. Uh, I don't know. Uh, let, 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 let's read this part. Uh, can you okay. do, do you have an access to a computer or somewhere? Yeah, you have it right in front of me. Okay, good, right good. Uh, beyond good and evil, uh, chapter one, uh, in the paragraph twenty-one. Okay, after so chapter one or wait, what chapter did you say? I'm sorry. Uh, chapter one. Yeah. Chapter uh-huh. one. Uh, Paragraph twenty one, but let, let it, it it's twenty one or twenty. Let me check. Wait, wait a second. Okay. Let me just check it once again. Don't be mistaken. Uh-huh. Okay, I'm at chapter twenty one. Yeah. No, chapter one, but uh, the paragraph uh, twenty. Yeah, okay. uh, I guess it's uh, wait. Okay, well, do you want do uh let me just read it real quick. Yeah, yeah, but uh wait. Few seconds, I just want to check it. Uh thank you.
Yeah, it's uh, yeah. No, it's earlier. Oh, it's early. It's sixteen. It's sixteen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sixteen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That was pretty interesting, though. This makes me want to read some Nietzsche one day. Yeah, it's sixteen. I've never read Nietzsche before. Yeah. So it starts. There are still harmless self observers. Okay. Yeah, I see it now. Uh, so I. I can, yeah, this is good. I can already tell. Can you read it aloud, and we we'll just you know. Okay, there are still harmless self-observers who believe that there are immediate certainties. For instance, quote unquote, I think, or as the superstition of Schopenhauer puts it, quote unquote, I will. As though cognition here got hold of its object purely and simply as the thing in itself, without any falsification taking place either on the part of the subject or the object. I would repeat it, however, a hundred times. That immediate certainty, as well as absolute knowledge and this thing in itself, involve a contradictio in ejecto. We really ought to free ourselves from the misleading significance of words. The people on their, on their part may think that cognition is, is knowing about things, but the philosopher must say to himself, when I analyze the process that is expressed in the sentence, I think, I find a whole series of daring assertions the argumentative proof of which would be difficult, perhaps impossible. For instance, that it is I who think that there must be something, that there must be necessarily be something that thinks, that thinking is an activity and an operation on the part of a being who is thought of, of as a cause, that there is an ego, and finally, that it is already determined what is to be designated by thinking, that I know what thinking is. For if I had not already decided within myself what it is, by what standard I could determine that which is just happening is not perhaps willing or feeling. In short, the assertion I think assumes that I compare my state at the present moment with other states of myself which I know in order to determine what it is. On account of this retrospective, this retrospective connection with further knowledge, it has, at any rate, no immediate certainty for me. In place of the immediate certainty in which the people may believe in the special case, the philosopher thus finds a series of metaphysical questions presented to him, veritable conscious, conscience questions of the intellect, to wit, whence did I get the notion of thinking? Why do I believe in cause and effect? What gives me the right to speak of an ego, and even of an ego as a cause? And finally, of an ego as cause of thought, he who, vent who ventures to answer these metaphysical questions at once by an appeal to a sort of intuitive perception, like the person who says, I think and know that this is at least true, actual, and certain, will encounter a smile and two notes of interrogation in a philosopher nowadays. Sir, the philosopher will perhaps have to give him to understand. It is improbable that you are mistaken, but why should it be the truth? Yeah, I'm, I'm like kind of messed up on the end there, but yeah, I don't know. I think that's really good. That's like some of my arguments against solipsism as well. But yeah, I think that was really good, by the way. Yeah, I think it's like this, this, uh, this idea of thinking, right? That when you, when you know that uh, thinking is something that you do, it's also it's also very controversial when you try to understand how it works. Sometimes you can perceive that it's just a process which, which goes on without uh, an ego that is responsible for this process. Mm -hmm. And when you say, okay, at least I'm conscious that I'm thinking, right? At least I know that uh, this is the process which uh, like I'm doing and this is something I can be sure of. It's, uh, yeah, you may, you may be right. You, you may be right that it, it, it's uh, like it describes the actual process, but at the same time, you can try to analyze it in depth. You see that it's uh, very hard to say that you, you, are, you actually know what is I, you actually know what is thinking, you actually know what does it mean to, yeah. you know, to get through this process. And yeah, definitely. 
an understanding of this process also like it may vary from person to person for someone thinking it's uh, just repeating whatever they you know heard or read uh, from somebody else and uh, for others is making sense trying to trying to plan like trying to think about the future for somebody's pure awareness and just you know uh, understanding what's going on right now and it's all thinking well, we can say that all these processes may be considered as thinking or problem solving when you try to work on a task when you can't just you know when you have to be present and when, when you have to keep in mind uh, a lot of things at once yeah yeah i agree i mean everything that there, i really think this is like amazing this is a side of nietzsche i never hear people talk about what i'm reading right what i what i just read like yeah i mean it was amazing right. uh let's talk a little bit more about uh like various questions philosophical questions okay remember, yeah, remember this good. question about uh, what are what were the most difficult questions you struggled with uh, during your philosophical journey yeah so there's a lot of questions so to start off just the questions of metaphysics like what is there like i didn't, that question always stumped me before i even like looked at it formally like before i knew the, the question of metaphysics like just trying to get a metaphysics like that was always just stumped me like what is going on you know what is all this stuff mm -hmm. that was a, a very interesting question to answer also like to have gotten an answer but yeah that was a a difficult question um another uh, really difficult sort of question top of my head um i don't know i think that's that's one of the biggest ones though um yeah i don't know what is truth that's another one that's an amazing question that's a mm -hmm. difficult question that was a i'm glad that got answered as well but yeah those are two of the biggest ones i think there's plenty of substance if we want to go into them do you want to go into them specific or to one of them specifically yeah we, we start from uh, metaphysics and uh, ontology okay yeah well so oh, okay well yeah where do we want to go do you want to like to give my answers to the question or yeah and, and, the process and, uh, how? i'm interested like how like now you're a radical empiricist but uh i'm interested okay. how how did you come to this view like uh was it uh, you said you said you started reading on it and uh, it was kind of appealing to you but uh, did you try to find like counter arguments and did you, did you try to, uh, to, to comes to yeah to question radical empiricism like how did you try to explore something else and to... um i'll be honest i haven't i haven't tried to i haven't heard any arguments against um, radical empiricism mm -hmm. but that's more yeah i mean that's kind of more like epistemically though like, i mean I don't, that's more like my epistemology but to put it like frankly i would say epistemology and metaphysics are like should be considered one branch of philosophy at, at the highest level i mean well i don't know i think everything collapses into metaphysics basically but like so i mean i think that that's fair like me, me being a radical empiricist is important to my metaphysics but yeah yeah but in in, meta, in, in metaphysics uh do you need language to understand it and uh, like epistemology, I guess it's mostly about the language and about the knowledge. How do we know what we know? Uh -huh. And to understand metaphysics, probably you don't even need language. So you may, you may just, um, as you see. Uh, I, think, I think to understand it, you probably do need language. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I think doing the discipline, of course, yeah, you're going to need it. But yeah, I don't know. I mean to understand it i guess it goes metaphysics goes beyond language at some point once you get a good one i would say once you have a good metaphysics mm -hmm. uh what what are your thoughts on uh, the idea that like the world is infinite for example you know this infiniteness um, finiteness in metaphysics like is it possible to understand uh, the universe as a whole and what this whole would mean for you yeah, so I would say that the universe is infinite in terms of scale, not necessarily like concept of numbers. I would say that numbers don't actually exist 
at least I would say they don't. Yeah, they don't. I would say numbers don't, or just abstracta in general. Abstract objects don't exist. But yeah, like the concept of infinity, just in terms of there's no like final scale or you know like the point where reality ends or something of the sort. Mm-hmm. I would say that is true. Like reality has no like final scale or particular scope that it ends at. And yeah, in terms of understanding that, uh, I would say uh, by understanding any part of the universe, you are understanding the whole. Like, essentially, the entire universe is within every part. Uh, like the Mahayana Buddhists like to talk a lot about this. They like to talk about how, like the Dalai Lama in particular, he talked about how within the, a piece of paper, there's the sun involved in it, and how uh, there's also like humans existing involved in the paper. Like, because the sun is what gives uh, rise to the trees and such, and then the trees give rise to the paper implicitly, but then the humans need to be there, and just how human beings, uh, the, what's it called, water, which is, like, oh, yeah, the other thing was, like, the lake or whatever, or the um, river, for giving the humans water to make the paper, and just shows how within this little piece of paper, there you can you can you might not be able to see it necessarily but implicit in it is all the other universe and yeah that's that's how it is for all objects and for any distinction within the universe which all an object is it's a distinction i would say or yeah any anything in the universe anything which is a distinction same thing i'm just kind of breaking down some metaphysics concepts i have also but yeah that's for yeah anytime you're understanding a part the part in the whole there is sort of no duality there is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, from an epistemological uh, point of view, like uh, you, you, it seems that you can't have a direct experience of everything, right? You can't have a direct experience of infinity. You can only argue, for example, you say there's a piece of paper, it contains everything because it was a part of tree and there was water and there was like a, to describe just one one piece of the universe, you have to bring up like everything what exists, but still it's kind of, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's logic, it's language. So you try to understand by, uh, you know, uh, by, by inductive argument or deductive argument or whatever, you can't have a direct experience how, you know, uh, a piece of paper was transformed from, you know, it was tree, then it became water and then transforms in uh, stardust. So is it, well, is it not con- like kind of, you know, and the same about infinity. Like, how can you, how can you imagine? Like, you may imagine it, but you can't actually have a direct experience of infinity. You can say what what is beyond uh, what, what what you can see or what what you can feel. You may you may say it, right? But it's logic, it's epistemology, it's language. It's not your direct experience. Yeah. Well, I would say that infinity is a i mean i would find it troubling to kind of say you can experience any sort of uh concept like infinity like infinity is just a description of the nature of reality it's just a description of the fact there is no final scale that you can do or i'm saying the fact but i mean i'm not trying to beg the question of my position but the idea at least or the if it is true basically that there is no scale or that there is no final like ending to where you can zoom in or zoom out to uh, reality so yeah i would agree with you that there's no way to really experience that in some sense because it's a concept and i don't think you can really experience um any concepts in some sense i think it's sort of this goes into another topic but basically i mean i agree with you mm-hmm. like in terms of, of that however arguably every direct experience is of infinity in some sense because it, assuming that the my position is true just this is just one particular scale there isn't no there is no such thing as like the ultimate scale of experiencing the entire universe this experience would be of the entire universe like any particular perspective uh, is experiencing the whole universe okay it's like every moment is uh is the whole and simultaneously it's a part of the whole right and if you experience just one moment you may say that you experience everything at once Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, c- can we talk a little bit more about uh, metaphysics and the concept of truth? I guess there's, yeah, uh, when we start from a distinction, like there's uh, 
in, in terms of knowledge, there's three types of knowledge, like uh, propositional knowledge, uh, procedural knowledge, and uh, yeah, I guess it's knowledge by acquaintance. And I'm I'm mostly interested in this propositional knowledge. How do you know that the statement which you make is, you know, is correct, is true? Yeah. So yeah, to answer that question, I would say that. Uh, for knowing because you have direct access um, to reality I don't think that in terms of knowing that something is true I kind of I don't think that that would make sense mm -hmm. then implicitly in knowing anything there would have to be some sort of truth involved like knowing is a process of like having justification with your truth and then having like an intention like a belief like so or that's my I take like the standard JTB account but in order for a proposition to be true, it just must correspond with direct experience or uh, reality, which is the, just their equivalent in my view. But so to core in terms of corresponding, this is sort of where uh, knowledge is an independent sort of thing. And you can have two people disagree on the truth value of a proposition, uh, even though their experience, they have a, a very similar experience. Because the truth is, when it comes to symbols and sounds and propositions, like they're, which all proposition is just a bunch of symbols, if, like it's written on a paper, or even in thought, like it's the concept of these sounds representing something. It's symbol, it's symbolizing still in some sense. But the point being that symbols can't represent reality. This is kind of this brings you into the other question you said too about infinity. You can't actually experience infinity. I would say there's an experience doesn't give you a way to represent anything representation and conceptualization and like correspondence like saying that something like the word water corresponds to what we might say in like an actual cup on the table with that sound water that it corresponds it is going to be dependent upon whatever mind is uh, having the knowledge or trying to acquire the knowledge or trying to do that but yeah, so I don't know if that really if that answers it. Okay, so here to answer it with all, with all the background. So a, 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 what's it called? Proposition corresponding to the truth just depends on if you believe that these symbols and such represent what you actually are observing or what you, or what you actually are experiencing. It so comes down to you, essentially. But I mean... So there are two people and uh, one of them describes a certain experience and the other, for example, has uh, the same experience. So they may basically uh, find something similar in symbols and say, yeah, this like what we're agreeing on, this certain experience which we both can uh, validate and say that this is true. And uh, um, at the same time, symbols themselves, like words, uh, logic, it doesn't make sense in itself. Like you're, like, there's distinction between foundationalism and the coherence theory of truth. And in foundationalism, basically, you say that okay, you don't need to explain further. There's an experience we both can see it, we both can touch it, and we can understand that this is true. Whereas in the second one, in co coherence theory of truth, there's uh, no, you have to be just uh, your understanding. Your language must be uh, uh, not contradic con contradictory. So you whatever, whatever you describe, it's just words, words about words about words about words. You say uh, the statement is true because uh, you know everything is uh, what expressed in, in the statement is not self contradictory. And then every concept describe every other concept. And you may go, yeah. you may go on forever without uh, appealing to a real experience. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, in terms of uh, truth, uh, I'll take the correspondence theory, which is yeah, just mm -hmm. so yeah. I don't take the coherence or the foundationalist uh, account for truth, but I mean, so the, the I'm so uh, I feel like wait, were you done? Like was yeah, I don't know. But I feel like I interrupted you. That's why. I was, yeah yeah uh like for me i still like i'm still i'm still trying to wrap my head around uh these uh, modern philosophical concepts and ideas i have i haven't actually studied too much uh, like academic philosophy i read lots of uh lots of books uh 
like old books, <laughs> I would say, like 19th century, 17th century, 18th century philosophers, like uh, you know, German philosophers and uh, French philosophers, English philosophers, Russian philosophers too, but uh, they do not use this modern, like these ideas, like for example, epistemology, it was an invention of like, at the end of 19th century, they just started using this word, even though they discussed it uh, like back to back to Plato or even pre to pre-Socratics, mm -hmm. like some, something related to it. And uh, in philosophy, all these new concepts, it's still, it's, for me, it's very hard to, <laughs> to yeah yeah that's fine i mean yeah i understand i'm I'm not by the way i'm not an academic either not yet at least but yeah but uh, uh yeah can we can, can, can we move on and take some other questions like you said the first one is uh, about uh, metaphysics like what what is there uh then the truth like, what, what's true yeah uh and i guess it's like epistemological question uh, were there other questions we should try to um think about uh, are you talking about an, an, uh, on a different note or still on truth uh, on truth and metaphysics yeah we may go on on truth and metaphysics but we may also like uh, connect it with other questions oh, okay uh yeah um i mean can i ask you a question yeah Sorry. sure yeah. sure Okay, yeah. Well, so regarding your favorite philosophers, like, can you keep doing some of your favorite people? Because it seems like you like Nietzsche. I don't know, but yeah, just go on about that. Yeah, I wouldn't say that I have a favorite philosopher, but uh, I, I may give you a few, like, uh, few lines. For example, one line is from Kant to Nietzsche, uh, and Kant, Hegel, Fichte, Feuerbach, Schopenhauer, and Nietzsche. I would consider this like this German philosophy uh, had a very heavy influence on on my perception of the world and on my thinking. And also, uh, there are some Russian philosophers. You probably are, are not familiar with them. It's, they mostly are kind of they're from the opposite uh, camp <laughs> or camp. Uh, they are they're not even like philosophers in terms in terms of uh, you know studying metaphysics or epistemology but they were mostly li literature critics and uh, uh, there was two movements in russia in 19th century so the one was basically all these novelists like uh, dostoevsky tolstoy turgenev uh, pushkin um, and others and uh, the second camp it was uh, their critics like Belinsky, Dobrolubov, Pisarev, and uh, like this Belinsky, Dobrolubov, Pisarev. I guess for me it's like the second line, uh, the second like you know the development of certain ideas uh, which uh, took s several personalities. Like for me, it's like one one one. I, when I when I look at uh, for example German philosophy, I do not uh, differentiate between for example Kant. Uh, Hegel, Schopenhauer, and Nietzsche. For me, it's just the development of one, one, one spirit, one idea through various persons. And the same uh, about Russian philosophers. But I also like, uh, you know, this, uh, some ancient philosophers like uh, Sextus Empiricus. I would count him as one of my favorite philosophers who helped me to, uh, to understand a lot of things. You know, are, are you familiar with uh, Sextus Empiricus? Um, I believe I've heard of him. Is he the guy who came up with empiricism? Yeah, no, no. It's he, he, <laughs> he, yeah, he, he, he practiced, uh, you know, there was a sect of uh, doctors, like emp empiricists, uh, but uh, he, he was uh, famous for his interpretation of Pyrrhonism. And uh, he was one of the, one of the founders of uh, you know, the skeptic school, like Pyrrha. Uh yeah, I've heard of him. I've heard of uh, there's a dude I know named Albedo. He told he uh, was telling me some stuff about this guy, and a few other philosophers, like a conversation they had. It was interesting, but I can't really remember it. But, yeah. In Sex Empiricus, basically, one one of his major work is Outlines of Pyrrhonism, and he uh, he categorizes all philosophy in three uh, parts. So he says there are such guys as uh, dogmatists. And uh, he says, like, everybody, like, 
Plato, Aristotle, Epicurus, Stoics, they all are dogmatists because they found truth. They know what was going on. They, they basically, they, they try to teach you their truth and they all contradict with each other. And uh, like, we, 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 can't, we can't actually take any, any one of them and say that they are true because if you follow another school, you see that they like, have the same valid arguments and they also claim that they found truth. So he basically dismiss all dogmatists and say that uh, uh, you know, we have to do something else. So the second part, the second school is uh, academics, and uh, it's uh, it's named it's named after Plato's Academy, and there was a guy, and you know, the the whole bunch of them who basically was uh, ancient agnostics, who said that there is no way to find any truth, like it's useless. Uh, we don't need to. We don't need to look for it. Truth is unattainable. Mm. And for sex and skepticism, by the way, it actually like the uh, meaning of the word. If you translate it literally, it uh, will it will be uh, investigation. So for Asia, for Asia, ancient uh, Greek uh, skepticism, it didn't oh. it didn't it didn't mean doubt. As now we understand skepticism as a doubt. But for them, it, 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 it has a different meaning. It also meant uh, investigation. So skepticism, basically, they say we, we, do not know, we do not know what's true, what's false, but we are trying to like, study. We try, we're trying to, we're, we, we have a hope to find out, but we do not, uh, we do not uh, attach to any, to any school. So we just go on for, we, we search for, for it, but we do not try to say that. We finally know what it is, and we're not and we're not deny that it's impossible to find too. And uh, there, there are some principles like uh, atera ataraxia, for example. They, I guess, they invent this, uh, this. They coined this term ataraxia, which is uh, for a skeptic. For a skeptic, it's a suspension of judgment. So you do not. Mm. You do not judge anything. You basically you you report what you can see, and this is about appearances again. We can get back to like this idea. Sex empiric was uh, cites it cites it very like very often in this uh, in this book outlines of Pyrrhonism. He said like uh, it's all about appearances. So we do not say about noumena. We can't we can't even tell anything about uh, this you know the, the world which we can't see. So for them. Metaphysics, if we divide it in two categories, like, you know, this world of our experience and uh, something that we can't see and that we can't comprehend, they say, we, we report only on those things that we can see. And they, for us, uh, are, you know, are not necessarily true, but we just, you know, we just say uh, what is in our experience without, uh -huh. actually, without trying to, you know, argue about the nature of uh, for example when, when now we discuss infinity right and we try to like make some claims say you know probably the world is uh -huh. infinite and for a skeptic uh, this claim uh, like it's it's impossible to make this claim he may say oh, some school some schools of thought say that uh, this is true the world is infinite and they uh, cite their arguments and say that's why they believe uh, why it's infinite and other schools of thought, they say it's finite, and here are their arguments. And we do not subscribe to any a, any one of them, but we just, you know, try to understand what they mean when they discuss <laughs> this idea. Uh -huh. Yeah. What, 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 what were your books, like, uh, or philosophers that you've read? Um, my favorite philosophers, I have a long list. I have Watts, he's up there. Mm -hmm. um, Wittgenstein. Uh, David Hume, um, Alfred Korzybski, uh, um, who's this Kirk, guy? Kirk, 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 you know who he is? Kirk Korzybski? No, I haven't heard. Yeah. I haven't heard of it. Can you can you can you type it? I'll check them out later. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, what, right. What's uh, Hume? Uh, David Hume. Yeah, 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 I'm familiar with the film of uh, Korzybski. Okay. Uh, can you tell me about this guy? Yeah, David Hume. 
he was a no, no, philosopher. No, 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 not Hume, this Alfred Korzybski. Oh, yeah, Korzybski. He's a philosopher of language. Um, yeah, he, he, he did a lot of things, but he was like, he was ontologic a little bit. He was a sort of a logician. He talked about sort of semantics and symbolism. Mm -hmm. yeah, and he talked, and his, some of his important concepts were like the map is not the territory. That's a quote from him. That's oh, really? kind of like, did, did he like coin this term, map not territory? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He coined that term. He was oh. yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's like a really popular thing from him. That's probably like the most popular thing to know about him. But yeah, he was sort of like a polymath. Like he he was into logic. He was into mainly he's known for philosophy of language and like semantics and such. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he had a lot of stuff. His, his, he talked about the structure and content and sort of how a proposition, he talks about like how I was just talking about a proposition corresponding to the truth, but he talks about just in general about a map or a model corresponding to reality. It's sort of dependent upon a similar structure. Uh, or he, he talks about like structure versus content and such. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest, I don't know a whole lot about that structure and content. Uh, kind of stuff from him. Yeah, it's like semantic versus syntax. Yeah. So in syntax, uh, yeah, I'm not, now I'm trying also to study this like uh, analy analytic philosophy school talks a lot about this distinction between semantics and syntax and Chomsky. Um, like Cyril also like discuss it in, in his lectures, like that's, what I'm trying to play. But right now I'm working on these like analytical philosophers. I guess I, I will check this guy too, Korzybski. Yeah. Yeah, he was really interesting. Yeah. So you also met like Hume, uh, Watts. Uh, like, uh, uh, let, let, let's discuss Hume a little bit. Yeah, so Hume's, I haven't actually read the treatise yet, but just from reading like SCP, just reading papers about some of Hume's concepts, yeah, like to, uh, I'm a big fan, like I'm a big fan, just like, just from seeing the range of stuff he talked about, like when I first read the problem of induction, it was, it was extremely interesting to me, or when I first uh, just like read about it on SCP, the problem of induction. What, uh, can, you, like, you know, can you elaborate a little bit on this, like the problem of induction? How it works, what it is. Yeah. So the problem of induction is sort of like how do we go from uh, induction or how do we go from uh, like experience to concepts like cause and oh, such? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I yeah how do we get to the cause? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've probably heard of, of that uh, from John Cyril. Like there's no, there's no, uh, there's no cause and effects. It's all just, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, by the way, I, I haven't read uh, this uh, yet, but uh, it's on my reading list. I'm, I, I want to study this argument that uh, because I, I'm mostly a determinist, so I do not think that there's such thing as a, as free will. And in, oh. Hume, in Hume, I suppose that he had like he he was very famous for developing this argument that uh yeah you know this uh but he also like it, he, he also he he did he he isn't just a like just determinist for i guess he his view is more sophisticated than simply uh, you know, describing what's going on in the world and everything is this subject of laws mm -hmm. of natures of the laws of nature and therefore you can have free will just because there's like we are living in some kind of new newtonian mecha mechanistical world mechanical world yeah he kind of stayed silent about what was actually going on uh, it's interesting Hume's really interesting about that because that's what he does a lot like on the, on the topic of god he does the same thing but he gives insights on our methodology like that's what the problem of induction is really just talking about on saying how from induction and from empiricism, effectively, you can't get to a concept of like a cause and effect or like a law of nature from empiricism. Mm -hmm. These are sort of like, yeah, like you can't get to them from induction or from 
experiments or from anything of the sort. And there's a different part of the uh, problem of induction, which is just about just generalizing about, well, here, I'll just read it, generalizing about the properties of a class of objects based on some number of observations of particular instances of that class. Example, the inference that all swans we have seen are white and therefore all, all swans are white before the discovery of black swans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's the other one. I forgot about that, but the cause and effect one, that's the main one that was interesting to me. I didn't know about that one until much later. That was like the that was the first thing I ever heard of from Hume was the his argument against cause and effect, which is a part of the problem of induction. Uh, by the way, what are your views on this uh, free will uh, versus determinism? Um, in terms of free will and determinism, I take the side of free will, but mm -hmm. I don't take a sort of uh what's the term i forget what the term is compatibilism but, uh not com um, uh, what's it called that's the term for the type of free will that like christians and people have which is like oh, unimpeded uh, i think that's the term unimpeded might be the term but li yeah i don't think there's unimpeded free will oh, okay but, yeah, okay yeah. but uh can we talk about these a little bit more like uh free will how how do you describe free will? Um, I describe free will as just the ability uh, to act or just, you know, agency, like intention, the ability to have intentions, which I believe any creature with a mind or, or the mind gives rise to the ability of sort. Yeah, but, but I don't. Mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah, go on, go on. Well, yeah, I don't think that free will implicitly, um, like, it doesn't get away from conditions. That's the sort of thing. Conditions, like free will or minds, are just a part of the of the conditions of the universe. I would say. So, like, uh, a chair, for example, would say, doesn't really have agency. Because, like, a chair doesn't have an idea or a mind or something. It doesn't have an idea of what it can and can't do like whereas for me i ha i construct an idea of like what's possible and such and i can sort of go through the options and say okay right now i want to open my refrigerator or i want to close it and i have the free will to open or close my refrigerator and but that doesn't get rid of the sort of conditions that need to be there for me to be able to open my refrigerator like gravity and such for my refrigerator to be on the ground with me for me to uh, grab it or whatever sort of conditions might be there. I think that that's sort of the issue. Like the mind is just one of these conditions that's there, which is gives it gives rise to intentions and like ideas about what I can do or and can't and like what I want to do and don't want to do. Mm -hmm. So there are certain condi conditions and uh, these conditions basically create this state of uh as you say, like free choice, you may you may choose between one or between, you know, between opening or closing your refrigerator. But uh, at the same time, when you think about it in retrospect, like, do you think it was possible to change, like, to to do to do something that you that you did, uh, or you know, to do something other otherwise? And if so, how can you how can you really um, so when it comes to possibility, I'm a modal fictionalist, which means like I don't think there is such a thing as like actual possibility. Like there's only possibility is just like a concept. Like I don't think that there. So in some sense, the answer to your question is yes, but I mean, in some sense, like in some sense, I don't think it's possible. But that's more so just because I don't really have an account for possibility outside of a fiction, like an idea. Of like what my intentions might be say for like a concept of the future the things i don't think like there is such a thing as an actual future for there to be con uh, of concept of possibility to happen and, and mm -hmm. such like all that happens now like i'm a i'll take that there is only the present moment and the present moment extends through what we might call the past and what we might call the future but there just is no like actual past and future is only right now like then the concept of like doing something else sort of they can like basically can be interpreted both ways like in some sense 
no, you can't change what happened because, you, I mean, all the conditions that uh, for that to happen, I do agree, some what agree with the cause and effect people basically, uh, in some sense about conditions and such. But the problem is more so just what do we mean by a cause and an effect, and why is there a distinction between them? And also, like, just trying to isolate stuff is the problem that I have with determinism. And also, determinism has other implications. Like, you could predict what would happen with certain, like, if you could find the cause. Like, I don't think there is such a thing as the cause or the effect or whatever, or any number of causes or effects specifically for something. I believe that, like, the universe is, uh, and everything that happens is implicit, like I said earlier, and everything else. So, sort of, this sort of, the, there isn't really this cause and effect thing. That's that's going on in that sense. I mean, mm -hmm. so yeah, I don't know. I feel like I might, I might have been, I might not have answered that well because I kind of delved into something different. But uh, yeah, can can you say the name once again? Like, uh, for, there's no possibilities. How it's called? Like, you said um, uh, modal modal fictionalism, which Mo is modal fictionalism. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I haven't heard of that. That's interesting. I will probably check it out later too. Modal fictionalism. Okay. Uh, but uh, then can, can can we say that uh, on an ontological level, there's free will. But when you think about it on kind of epistemological level, you see that it's just, uh, you know, you can't actually describe anything in terms of, uh, you know, this free will idea. But it's like if it's there, you, you may say, oh, I'm free because I'm not uh, under an obligation of doing something or I'm not forced by somebody else. So freedom means not that your actions are you know somehow like stem from uh, previous actions but uh, free will means that I'm not I'm not like I, I have a I have a choice even though this is when, when I think about it uh, after I, I do certain action I see that there there was no choice because uh, it was basically the continuation of it's, it doesn't mean that they necessarily like uh, one one action was a cause and another action was an effect of this. You may say that every cause is also is is an effect and every effect is a, is a cause, but uh, still there is some kind of continuation between your experience, which you may observe, which you may feel. But uh, once again, there's ontological and epistemological distinction. So on an ontological level, when you have experience, it feels as if you are. Uh, having choice as if you may you may decide to, to raise your right arm or left arm and this is what you call free so that you are not binded by you know whatever to just do one thing but then when you when, when you describe it on an epistemological level especially in retrospect you see that there's no way for you to do like to raise your left arm if you had raised your right arm or vice versa if that makes sense it's it seems I, like I'm, try, I'm, I'm, just, I, I'm trying to describe kind of my understanding of this idea of free because for me yeah free will well I can understand it when we discuss uh, discuss it on a like on kind of superficial level but uh, as soon as I start thinking about how for example I may want something that I want and how I can like I, I I can find the room for free will when I think about my past, and uh, then I I can find it in even in the present moment since it, there's a feeling that uh, everything what I'm doing right now is determined by everything I've done before, and there's no separation between like past and present and future. If there's just one moment, it feels as if this is just a continuation of this moment. Mm. Uh, you may yeah, help. I would, I would, you may help me to clarify ahead. it. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I think that it's pretty close. I mean, uh, it's just in terms of this, the description might be a little bit weird. Like, it might be a little bit misleading. Uh, like for example, when you say there's an epistemological or an uh, ontological distinction, I don't think that there is in this case for. Like for my view, at least, like from terms of what I'm saying, I'm just I'm saying that there is no actual cause. Uh, 
like in both cases epistemologically or uh ontologically like yeah and the problem of induction is a a sort of problem of an epistemology uh, but i don't think ontologically there's cause and effects like uh, that's a big category of ontology i don't think that that I yeah, think you that you can collapse the, yeah, the category of cause. You, yeah, go, you, yeah, say, go, go. you say you say that uh, when we uh, find like, when we use this uh, term cause, right? We may predict what's uh -huh. going to happen in the future, and you say uh -huh. there's no ultimately there's no future. There's only uh, like this particular like present now. And uh, yeah. when I use the word cause, I probably like for me for me it doesn't mean exactly that one thing. Uh, predicts the other for me it's it, like the meaning of this word is that my experience what i'm doing it's uh, like i can't do otherwise so uh, everything causes everything else but at the same time it doesn't mean exactly that we get from one state to another and say that there is a co causal connection well yeah it's very it's very it's very vague i still can't it can be, but uh, you know, I use this word determinism uh, not because I like you know studied determinism and uh, uh, realized that this is the closest position, but simply because it uh, describes uh, vaguely uh, like my my the, the way how I think, the way how I view the world, and maybe it's not maybe it's not even correct. I'm not sure. Maybe I like I'd, I'd like to check this motto motto what was it motto fictionalism. Let me write it down. Moto fictionalism. Moto uh, moto fictionalism. I'll type it in uh, chat. Moto. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I still. Yeah, I thought moto fiction. <laughs> moto fiction. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I feel like, I mean, if we if we talked about it, we'd probably find that we agree about it, about the determinism thing. It seems like we listen to some of the same people are interested in some of the same sort of concepts. Like from earlier, it seems like, like most of my, my views haven't changed that much since when I was first listening to Alan Watts. And mm -hmm. like, yeah, a lot of the positions that you kind of say, like about how there's just now and stuff, like I agree with them. There's pretty much like my positions today and a lot of them come from people like Watts and such so yeah mm -hmm. but yeah I don't know I'm kind uh, of bad at explaining these things though like I'm kind of, I wish I was better at articulating but, yeah. let's take some concepts uh, like philosophical concepts which uh, you encountered while studying philosophy or you know doing thinking yeah, so some concepts. We covered a lot already now, right? From like, wait, what would you say? Yeah, we, we covered like I mean during this conversation we discussed uh, epistemology, metaphysics, uh, free will, determinism, Hume, Hume's idea of like in, induction, that you can't. What was the like? What was the idea like induction? How, how was it called? Um, the the what was the idea? You want me to, uh, to explain the idea again of a problem of induction? Yeah, problem. Okay, okay. problem. Yeah, problem of induction. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's just the idea that uh, from from uh, observations and past events, the the some there's only an assumption that future events will correspond to them. That's the heart of the problem of induction. So, like, yeah, if we only see white swans, the the idea that all swans are white, or that a yeah, swan can, yeah, even we can, we can generalize right about the future, like we can say anything because it may be just different. We, we can we can talk only about things that we have experienced, but we can talk about things that we haven't experienced yet. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's mm -hmm. the heart of it. Okay. Yeah. So let, 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 let's move on and like. You you may probably tell me uh, about other concepts which uh, you are interested in while studying philosophy. Okay, yeah, there's a really interesting concept that uh, I recently came uh, like that I came onto. It's called uh, whole lines, which is the whole concept about the whole and the part and such, and how they're identical. Which is yeah, the whole concept of holons is that everything in reality is simultaneously a whole and a part, 
and yeah, and just that. Yeah, I guess I. Sense. Yeah, I, I guess I heard the short lecture on this uh, idea of columns. Uh, have, have, uh, are you familiar with uh, the guy like Leo Gura? Yeah, I'm very familiar with him. Yeah, I guess I've I've heard it from from this guy. Same, same. That's what I've 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 even watched the full video on it about that. This is like a very new idea to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm very familiar with Leo though. He's influenced my views a lot. Yeah, I actually, yeah. yeah, I, I, I uh, you know, I started listening to this guy quite a long time ago. Uh, I guess it was 2016. Uh, at the time, I couldn't even understand English. I, I, I just le learned English, and I discovered. I, I also was practicing this, you know, meditation and stuff, and I could listen to him and understand probably 20 percent of what he said. But it was, you know, so so, so convincing. And finally, like in, in half a year, I, I listened him quite a lot i mean almost since since 2016 till 2018 uh for a couple of years i probably watched every every episode but then oh wow yeah but then i started kind of you know it seems that he repeats himself over and over and uh like often there's some kind of dogmatism involved especially recently about this you know this idea of god and he talks a lot about you know you are God, you are God. <laughs> Sometimes it's funny to listen to all of this, and I, I guess I can understand. Like I can, I can agree on lots of things he says, but uh, often it's too like it for me. It uh, feels as if he is kind of you know as if he is talking to people who do not and like when he tries to say that you know I'm kind of above uh, uh, an average human perspective and whatever I'm saying to you is like super super like almost like an alien uh world view i i think mm. i think that he, he he tries to you know what he's doing it's not i can't i can't take it seriously in terms of you know i mm. i think i can understand almost everything he says like following him for a couple of years and reading literature uh i i have no problem with understanding anything like sometimes i even see that i can like probably not explain, but I can understand something even better than he can understand. But at the same time, he's okay. his uh, like the way how he presents himself as a like uh, omni uh, omniscient om <laughs> omniscient guy who knows everything, who experienced God and experienced everything else. It, it creates a sense of you know. It's very it's very hard for me to take it all seriously. Even though I may agree, you see, the, yeah. the point is I may agree on everything he says, but still the way how he delivers his message, delivers his content. Uh, after 2018, I like I, I watched him accidentally, like from time to time, maybe once a month, maybe once a couple of months. And I've noticed that it's it's hard for me to listen to whole episodes. Like before I could like listen mm -hmm. for, for two hours and... Uh, yeah, and it was fascinating, but now it's like 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and then ex there are some exceptions. I wouldn't say that every episode uh, is like that. There are some exceptions. And the whole is my, I probably listened to the whole thing. In one of the recent uh, videos uh, about foolishness, I wouldn't say it's too, like uh, probably he, uh, he made this episode probably half a year ago or a year ago. Yeah, but this idea of foolishness. I also I remember I was studying this idea of foolishness. It was one of the topic of my uh, uh, speaking English speaking clubs. And uh -huh. uh, yeah, I discovered him uh, talking about it, and I was thinking, well, wow, this is exactly how I how I want to develop the topic that you know we're all fools and we yeah. like the, the point. Yeah, I've never seen that episode from Leo, by the way. The foolishness one. I've seen a lot of his videos, but not that one. Wait. Yeah, I would, I, I would, I would recommend that you, <laughs> that you will watch uh, this. Uh, this foolishness is uh, very fascinating in terms of, you know, he, he is, he is less dogmatic there, but he, his ideas on wisdom. Yeah, basically, it's, it's about wisdom. So he just uses uh, foolishness as a, as a counterexample of wisdom, and he tries to show how, like, and 
how our mind uh, perceives these concepts like foolishness versus wisdom uh, for many people what they believe is wisdom it's actually foolishness <laughs> and, uh -huh. and and vice versa when you believe that this is foolish it's actually maybe quite wise yeah well yeah relating to leo i have some questions about it for me then uh, or to, to ask you about it yeah sure. what do you think a video from leo uh oh, can you say it again what's your favorite like concept that leo talks about oh, okay videos. Favorite... yeah i would say the those which i discovered at the beginning he talks a lot about sex uh, like he has an he has episodes on sex empiricus by the way and uh, this was so fascinating for me because i've just read it in 2015 and uh after a year I, and i i would say that sex empiricus was uh, one of the most influential thinkers whom i came across during my studies of philosophy and after and i couldn't find anybody at all with whom i could talk about sex empiricus it's like uh, no, no, nobody seemed to uh, like and it was russian language now i can of course find lots of people who you know study sex empiricus and talk about him but in russian language uh there are almost no research on, on him like there's a couple of volumes which i've read but they were written like 30 40 years ago and published and now there's no discourse on sex empiricus but uh, i was influenced by him and i was thinking almost for a year about this idea of skepticism and later when mm -hmm. i discovered uh, when, when leo uh, recorded an episode on sex empiricus and it was an, an episode on skepticism but he talked about sex empiricus the whole episode for an hour and a half and i was so so glad to find to find mm -hmm. this as well this is like he, he actually takes him like he he sees sees uh, him almost in the same way as I see, and uh, yeah, I, I I guess it helped a lot me like it helped me to understand even better what I read, and also free will. He talks about free will determinism almost at uh, the same time. So it's 2016. I would say it's the autumn of 2016, like five years ago. But later, yeah, later there yeah. was later. I would say uh, an episode on authority. Have you watched this episode? Like, well, no, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that one. Authority. I guess it was recorded uh, maybe a couple of years ago. Like time flows so fast. I saw the little free will and determinism, though. And he has a new. He's a newer one on it also, where he kind of walks back some, where he talks. He kind of walks some stuff back that he said in that one, and he kind of talks about it more. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Self deception. I would say those episodes also quite good. Yeah, I've, I haven't seen that one. But, uh, yeah, I've seen of all these episodes that you said. Like, I've seen the skept of the skepticism one, but I never clicked on it. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, yeah. What kind of other guys uh, do you watch on, on? You know, um, there's some really, excuse me, good philosophy tubers. Like, there's a dude named Kane B who's really good. He talks a lot about morality, though. That Kane B. Me up. Uh, Kane B. Uh, can you type all of them? Like, uh, because for me it's still yeah. Okay, Kane B. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me see. I'll go to my YouTube subscription list. He's like the most. He's the main guy who I watch. But mm -hmm. yeah, Leo. Obviously, he's sorry the second main guy that I watch. Um, let's see where are they at? Where's those philosophy guys? I got a lot of subscription. Do watch lectures, by the way. Like for me, I consume um, mostly lectures like by some professors occasionally like, but not really occasionally if there's mm -hmm. like yeah, i'm not the biggest fan of like i mean i watch them on other stuff but on philosophy i'm not really a big fan mm -hmm. of yeah but yeah i don't know i can't find any philosophers on it but there's other philosophers i watch mainly kane b and leo though okay. kane b just talks about general philosophy stuff and then yeah, I recently stumbled across the channel of uh, Michael Shugre. If you if you are interested in, in, in morality and in philosophy, he is uh, well. He is a brilliant speaker, but this uh, like I I wouldn't say that I can relate to uh, like what he is like. He he has he he has an agenda which I don't like. Like he tries to present this uh, kind of a certain certain worldview so he 
he he he has lectures and uh, various thinkers. And now I, I I've watched during the last week uh, three lectures on Plato, lectures on lectures on Thomas Aquinas, uh, Adam Smith, Montesquieu, uh, Kant, Hegel, and he he's a kind of moralist. Like, uh, but at the same time, he's as a speaker, he's just brilliant. He takes like he, all these lectures. It's like 40, 45 minutes. And uh, he speaks like I probably even better than Jordan Peterson. I don't know. Like Jordan Peterson, when I watched his lectures uh, four years ago, before he was actually engaged in this political, you know, political uh, agenda, he, his lectures also very good. And uh, I, 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 I almost haven't heard anything close. Like in terms of in terms of form. So now I'm not talking about the content. For example, in Jordan Peterson, yeah, there's, you, you, you may argue, like, I, I, what he's talking about, I don't uh, like too much uh, not nowadays. But in terms of form, like how he presented his lectures in 2016 and 2017, like Maps of Meaning and uh, Personality in this Transformation, I would say that I haven't heard anything like of the same quality in terms of his performance. And this guy, Michael Sugra, yeah, I would just make write it here you just want to uh, type his name out in the chat also for me yeah, yeah yeah this guy yeah and uh one of my favorite uh, guy whom i found a couple of years ago in 2019 is west cecil west uh, type his name out too I mean, like, like this all these people <laughs> west, west cecil he's kind of comedian I mean, he's a philosopher, <laughs> but uh, all, all his lectures, they're so, so funny. For me, like being, being uh, familiar with, uh, you know, philosophers who, he has very many playlists and he is in business for like for many years, for 10, I guess he started uploading his lectures at 2012. And most of it, it's, uh, you know, he takes uh, either philosophers and goes through, you know, various philosophers just uh, presenting them in a kind of historical content uh, context. And uh, he also takes some languages and for example, there are lectures on almost all lang languages, like starting from Egyptian language and uh, to modern European and uh, you know, other languages. If you wanna, if you wanna watch like- yeah. a, yeah, in, in West Cecil, if you want to watch his lecture, I, I recommend that you just start from the first lecture. I guess it's on, on philosophers, it's on Nietzsche, uh, on Kant, like the, start from, from, the, from the beginning, because these lectures are like the most, uh, you know, at least for me, they're the most. Uh, Wait, hello. Yeah, the greatest, I would say. Oh. You cut out for a bit. I don't know if you said something. All I heard was the greatest, and I missed like the middle of it. But you know, yeah, I'm I'm saying that uh, like if you want to watch West Cecil, I I would recommend that you start from the beginning, like uh, okay. from his okay. oldest oldest videos. The first playlist is uh, very amusing and uh, very informative, by the way. And he has uh, kind of a different perspective from what I uh, saw in terms of you know there's lots of professors of philosophy and they basically uh, like they say the same the same the same shit <laughs> over and over uh -huh. they just uh yeah. take uh, some kind of uh, approved position and just you know uh, re retell everything was written on wikipedia or on stanford encyclopedia of philosophy they just kind of they read uh, other you know they they read books whereas this guy he presents a kind of unique, unique view, and he, yeah, I, I admire him mostly for his humor. So when I listen to his lectures, I may just laugh out loud, even if I'm alone in a room. <laughs> because sometimes he gives mm -hmm. such, like, such great, uh, great. You know, he presents, he presents his, like, not his, but he presents his philosophers in a kind of very amusing way. Anyway, uh, I think we may just have a, just one one more 
I wouldn't call it a concept, but uh, one more thing I'd like to like, to discuss, and then we may finish this. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, the idea of wisdom. This okay. actually, uh, let me tell you, this uh, probably the main reason why I'm recording this podcast. I, I'm looking for the wisest uh, <laughs> living being. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, okay. yeah, I have kind of like, you know, a Socrates. So I, I, try, to, I try to find who is the wisest man on earth right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, what's it called? My answer to that question would be sort of context dependent. In terms of philosophy, um, I don't know if wisdom would mean the same thing and, you know, the love of wisdom as philosophy. But for me, I think having wisdom is having true understanding of the nature of phenomena, as like the Mahayana Buddhists say, mm. which is realizing like impermanence, emptiness, and uh, I don't know if there would be a third thing, but mainly like those two, impermanence and emptiness of phenomena would be having wisdom, would be like having true understanding of what that means for phenomena to be impermanent and empty and lacking selfhood that's the third one lacking mm -hmm. independence or selfhood like all phenomena is interdependent and you know empty and i forget to, yeah all of them interdependent empty and impermanent and so that that would be to have wisdom would be to yeah to have understanding of that and i could go into those concepts a little more if you want me to but yeah, in terms of in terms of the love the love of wisdom, I'm not I don't know necessarily what wisdom means. I guess it just depends on the person. But yeah. yeah, but for for you, for you, I'm not asking you for uh, yeah. universal uh, definition, but how how you perceive it? Like, what's what's your what's how would you describe? Yeah, wisdom? that's for, for you. Yeah, that's what I would describe it as. For uh, I would describe it the same way the Mahayana Buddhists would. I would say that I I would consider myself to be wise. And yeah, like I would consider that wisdom, just having true understanding of the nature of phenomena, the nature of phenomena, or having understanding of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, like uh, having understanding like, doesn't imply that you have to like that you have it. Uh, like, <laughs> how to get understanding? How? Um. Wait, I'm confused. How, What's how, the how, question? Yeah, how, how to get wise, like uh, how, how to achieve this, you know, this understanding, how, how like, again, meditation, reading, thinking, talking to people, probably. <laughs> um, yeah, well, for, I would say meditating on specific concepts, and you'll see all these things. I would say, yeah, meditating specifically, doing philosophy in general. Uh, yeah, like just reading about like you said reading books about philosophy will get you to eventually this understanding like i mean mm -hmm. yeah, that's at least my that's my belief that's my prediction mm -hmm. is that if people do meditate eventually they'll they'll understand if they do like read philosophy but i mean who knows about just the reading philosophy part the more important part is probably meditation mm -hmm. yeah so can... and meditating on specific concepts like not just sitting just sitting but also, like thinking about the concepts while you're meditating. There you go. Yeah, uh, let me read uh, just a small passage from, you know, uh, about impermanence. I've actually studied this idea of change also a year ago, and I came across an uh, came across an interesting, like an interesting passage. It's short, just few sentences, and uh, I, I'm I, I want to ask like uh, how your understanding is uh, close to closer maybe not close to this so uh, being is an empty fiction the state of becoming doesn't produce fixed entities such as being subject object substance thing there these false concepts are necessary mistakes which uh, consciousness and language employ in order to interpret the chaos of the state of becoming the mistake of greek philosophers was to falsify the testimony of the senses and negate the evidence of the state of becoming by postulating being as the underlying reality of the world, they constructed a comfortable and reassuring afterworld, where the horror and the process of becoming was forgotten, and the empty abstractions of reason appeared as internal entities. So this is it. 
That sounds perfect. I would like to emphasize on the, what's it called, the abstractions part, and I like to emphasize on the part of how the mind constructs and, and through reasoning and symbols and such constructs uh, a sort of concept of, you know, these beings, which, you know, like being relative to becoming, which is like changing, mm -hmm. you know, these beings that like just, or things that just exist and have like selfhood independent of everything else. And yeah, like such stuff like that. And that aren't interdependently originating. Yeah, this sort of concept of like what was the beginning of everything, stuff like that. Like, what is the origin of everything? And questions that people ask that come from the the misuse of these concepts. Like, come from like the uh, the passage you just read said, uh, words and such that sort of imply these things. Like, there's a beginning or mm -hmm. there's an origin and stuff. And people get caught up on questions like that, and they don't understand like that it's, it's reality is interdependently originating and there is no beginning other than like right now which is arguably i mean a fleeting moment and there's another one i mean like yeah it's it's i don't know i'm, I'm kind of going off track but yeah but yeah. I, I can i can understand you yeah I, and uh yeah for me this is what strikes me the most that there's this constant uh permanent change and uh yeah, you may like i i'm i'm mostly on this side that there's uh, everything is changing and uh nothing is the same uh, at the same and at the same time you see that uh, this is the same like changes the change the change itself yeah it's constantly exactly. uh, like this transformation and it seems that you may view it like you know this uh rabbit duck uh picture and there's a rabbit and there's a duck Right, but you may like you may view it one once as a rabbit, and then you may transform your vision and see it like a duck. Yeah, yeah. and the same with constant change. So sometimes you like, <laughs> like you view it as change, but then you like you kind of zoom out and you see it as the permanent thing, and then you zoom in and it's like it's it's not permanent; it's constant. Yeah, yeah. This is like non-duality as heart. Which is the most interesting concept in philosophy that I've come across, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, like there, there's, there's a common theme just to kind of wrap up my position on all philosophy and the universe, like and just like every like my metaphysics. Non-duality is like the biggest concept. Like we see it within the part and the whole thing earlier. Now with the change in constant, we didn't go into it that much, but like the self and the other, uh, or the ego versus like not the ego or whatever. And the end, all dualities collapse. Like that's sort of the the ending of my philosophy, or like to sum up all of my philosophy. It's just like yeah, the yeah, I would it's say like non duality. Yeah, I would yeah. say I also came to it to, to some to some extent, but I'm still I'm still trying to explore. See, I'm not like <laughs> I still uh, ha, like ha, have a possibility that uh, you know I may be mistaken, and all this may be just a permanent again permanent state. Now I believe that this is true. This oh. is how it works, but maybe. Maybe I'll encounter something that will make me change my mind. So I still leave the, the possibility yeah. that I'm not fully, you know. That I, of course, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. It's not like for me too. I don't. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm searching so much though. My bad for interrupting. Go ahead. I thought you were you paused. I thought you were done. There you go. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, what's it called? So if you say that you kind of agree with it, like, is there anything you would like sum up your philosophy to me? Tell me, like, which, uh, but, like, yeah, sum up your philosophy to me. Yeah, I don't, like, uh, I would say that skepticism probably still the most appealing, mm -hmm. the most appealing position, which I, which I don't even know how to, like, how, how to find a way out of there. I'm just, like now I'm studying John Searle's, uh, you know, this uh, naive realism, as he calls it. But it's not just about, like, it's just a cliche, but actually there's so much. And uh, there's three three courses of lectures on, on the internet, on YouTube. Uh, one course is on the philosophy of mind, another on the philosophy of uh, society, and the third is on the philosophy of language. And mm. there's eight years. 
84 lectures and i am almost uh, yeah each lecture is in one hour and 15 minutes on, on average and i i, I almost finished uh, like <laughs> all of these lectures there's 10 le 10 lectures left and i'll say yeah i've done i've got to this playlist but uh, it's just the beginning i uh, for me i'm also reading his book mm -hmm. and uh, now i think i understand what he is talking about but i definitely see that i can't uh, talk about it myself yet so i can take uh, all these concepts and especially what i'm interested is in is the theory of language like speech acts oh. uh, all our language it's kind of uh, it's like acts of there's uh, various types like affirmative affirmatives uh commissives uh, directives uh, expressives and declarations and his main idea is that uh, all our social world all or all our social reality is uh, created by language mm. by these speech acts sounds yeah. similar sounds similar to some postmodern philosophers. Yeah, but he's like, he, he's not he's definitely not a, not a postmodern philosopher. He criticizes. Uh, he he had even an argument with. Uh, yeah, it was famous. He was famous for having an argument with uh, uh, not Derrida, but who was the other guy? Derrida. Mm. Okay. No, 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 no. Another decon de deconstruct de decon deconstructivism. Derrida is the only guy I know about deconstructionism. And Foucault, well, Foucault, I know him for deconstruction, I'm pretty sure, too. I'm pretty sure both of them. Yeah, but who, who, who wrote this simulacrum and sim simulacrum? Like, in, was it Derrida? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. What's the name of the book again? Uh, simulacrum uh, and simulacrum. Let, let me check it out. See. I see. What, yeah, Baudrillard, Jean Baudrillard. Yeah, but no, yeah, I guess Cyril argued with with Derrida, not with Baudrillard. But the the book is Simulacre and sim Simulation. Yeah, Simulacre and Simulation. It's uh, the book from uh, you know from the movie Matrix. <laughs> you know, at the beginning. Oh. At the beginning of this movie, he takes a, a chip out of this, you know. Uh, if you watch, if you watch yeah, the movie, I've never seen, I've never seen Matrix. No, I've never, I've never seen it. You've never seen Matrix? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, crazy, right? I've, I've to always say I'm gonna watch it. I never have. But yeah, when I was a kid, I never watched it. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I guess, uh, I guess we may end here. So it was very interesting to have a talk with you. I really appreciate yes, your fun time. Uh, I guess we may do it probably later if you come up with some new ideas and uh, if you if you have you know some, some something else to discuss, we may just yeah. I think that we may like you know there's so much actual philosophy i guess we've just scratched the surface if go if yeah yeah i'd love to do another one i'm sorry i thought i'll probably feel a little low energy i feel like i'm kind of a little bit low energy because the time is two almost 2 a.m for me but yeah i mean yeah but i don't know yeah and I, I, I don't know. yeah for, for me it's the opposite i just woken up <laughs> an hour ago before we start the conversation